Most sciences consider carbon dioxide to be the primary culprit in climate change. But what if carbon dioxide could be converted into things people would want to buy? These cylinder-shaped bricks, fresh out of the oven, are made out of a mixture of limestone and carbon dioxide. The CO2 is provided by a tank that's used to simulate the concentration found in the emissions of a coal-fired power plant. Traditional cement is produced by binding sand and stone together with water, a process that produces carbon dioxide, around a ton of CO2 for every ton of cement. Gurav Sant teaches civil engineering at the University of California, Los Angeles. This is a place where you spend a lot of time, I imagine. Well, we've spent a lot of time down here, especially over the last Got couple of months. Got some carbon dioxide going on here. Yeah, Big vats of CO2. That's right. So to put this in perspective, the cement industry puts out about 9% of the world's CO2 emissions. 9%. Right? Give or take, right? He and his team are semi-finalists in the Carbon X Prize, a competition for coming up with new ways to capture carbon and turn it into something. What we're trying to do is build a really large Lego set for adults, um, but which you can use for construction. The winning team gets $20 million. During our visit, monitors hired by the X Prize observed more scientifically precise stress tests than my own. It's about 10 pounds. I would love to take one of these home as a souvenir, but I don't want to pay the baggage charge. It's heavy. It is. I'm not sure that's the judge, but nevertheless. Oh. All right, it survived the stress test. <laughs> and what we're really working on now is going from something which is, let's say, a validated laboratory concept to a scalable solution. Sant's solution first involves heating up limestone to create calcium hydroxide. CO2 is released in that process, but the calcium hydroxide then begins absorbing CO2 from the environment. This is how seashells are formed over long periods of time. It can take up about 50% of its own weight. Um, in, in carbon dioxide. In, in carbon dioxide, um, which is really quite a lot. The key step that we've been able to achieve is really shortening the process. The process is shortened in this reactor. The reactors are controlled in terms of pressure and temperature and relative humidity and CO2 concentrations. It's um, an oven. It's basically an oven. You know, it's kind of like going from an oven to a microwave. What used to take two hours now takes you 10 minutes. Okay. Have you found the right temperature? Yes, we do know of the range, but clearly I can't speak about it. Why? Intellectual property. We don't want to give away all our secrets. The 34-year-old professor knows the secret to scaling up the process and bringing it to market is making his bricks less expensive to produce than those currently available. That's the point the X Prize is trying to prove, that carbon can compete with fossil fuels. Marcius Extivore heads up the Carbon X Prize. An independent investment group thinks that there could be a market of up to $1.2 trillion for carbon-made products, right? That's right. That sounds just kind of absurd to me. I mean, 2030, that's, you know, 13 years away, and you're going from zero to over a trillion dollars? It's not that far away. You know, we're not going from zero today. Almost zero. Almost zero, that's for sure. I think what they did was look at what are all the possible technologies out there that we see? What are the more mature ones that could be ready to actually deploy? We're not talking about you know, new, really crazy out there products, but if we made bread and butter stuff that we already use today with the best technology today. Literally bread and butter? Maybe not bread and butter, but things like uh, you know, cinder blocks, carbon fiber, fuels, plastics, polymer, fertilizers. At the end of the day, is this anything more than feel good? I think it is. What we're really trying to do is say, this is a promising technology. This idea of converting CO2 into stuff. We really think it can reduce emissions. And we think there's a business opportunity, which means it could run on its own. We're on the road southwest of Houston, Texas. And we're on our way to go visit a coal-fired power plant called Petronova. 
the largest power plant in the country that's deploying a technology that captures a pretty significant portion of the carbon that it emits into the atmosphere. Maybe the next project, after seeing the success here, can get even bigger. These guys saw a win-win opportunity to help the environment and also make some money. This coal plant has been around for decades. It provides around 30% of the Houston area's electricity. The private investors got in on the deal because Petronova, instead of burying the CO2 in the ground, sends it to an oil field 85 miles away. There, it allows them to extract more oil. Our next stop is the same place where the captured carbon is headed, the West Ranch oil field. West Ranch started oil operations in the 40s? In the 30s, In the 30s, actually. okay. Yes, it's produced millions of barrels of oil for all of those decades. And then, in the late 2000s, it went dry. Kind of. There was more oil, but it was stuck. That oil is stuck to the rock. We've gotten all the oil out of this reservoir that we can. Um, so we have to do something different to get additional oil that right. otherwise wouldn't be produced. Now, I imagine some people who are watching this will be critical of this idea because they'll think, well, this may be one step forward capturing the carbon, but two steps back if you're using it to extract oil. The demand for the oil in the U.S. is there, right? That demand is either going to be met with a domestic supply or with a foreign supply of oil coming in. Huh. Um, so the CO2 project brings new life to this field to recover 60 million barrels of reserves that otherwise would be unrecoverable. That is a lot of oil. To That's recover. a lot of oil. That would otherwise be left in the ground. The fact that you're putting that CO2 to an economic use will then encourage future projects to capture CO2, right? This is not dependent on government funding or a research project. This is a true commercial project that can, can thrive on standalone. Right, one thing that I found interesting was that they actually had to build a gas-fired power plant just to provide the energy required to do the CO2 capture. They're not actually capturing that much carbon um, that's it, coming out of the plant. <laughs> but they're not apologizing for that. They're still proud of the fact that they're able to capture that 10%. It's right. a big deal. Well, yeah, they, well, they see themselves as pioneers. In late July, we paid a visit to Wally Broker, a professor at Columbia University. He's known as the grandfather of climate science. Given his unheeded warnings over decades about CO2, we expected to meet a pessimist. We were wrong. I, I think that the one that has the least chance of being destroyed is us, because we have technology and bad things could happen. But what Broker thinks needs to happen goes way beyond capturing carbon from power plants. I think eventually a decision will be made to take CO2 out of the air or else the whole world is going to go crazy. I mean, we've got to learn to deal with these problems and they aren't going to be solved by 180 nations meeting in Paris. Sucking CO2 out of the air? At this point, the idea presents colonized Mars level technological challenges. My best friend that's doing this is a guy named Klaus Lochner. Klaus Lochner at Arizona State University is developing CO2 air capture contraptions. So again, how much did you estimate it would cost to be pulling out of the atmosphere what we're currently burning now plus the carbon that's already up there? That we oh, well, it, I mean, that would be $100 trillion or something. Went, to get it all back out again? The Carbon X Prize isn't touching air capture. Professor Guarov's brick-making technology requires CO2 from high concentration sources, like flue gas from power plants. Do you feel like air capture is in the future? Unless we have a remarkable, remarkable scientific breakthrough, I think air capture is not likely to happen. I think the economics just work against it. Broker, who doesn't use the internet, didn't know about the Carbon X Prize until we told him about it. Stupid. Stupid? It's stupid because there's too much. This is your opportunity to reply to the grandfather of climate science. All right, well, we haven't, I haven't spoken to Dr. Broker about this directly, 
But look, he's right. There's too much carbon out there to make stuff out of all of it. The point is, making stuff out of some of it, we think is an important step. Burying it under the ground costs money. Making it into the stuff makes money. In theory, don't expect to see at the mall the carbon shoes we tried on anytime soon. Thanks for watching this episode of Moving Upstream. I'm Jason Bellini. Hope you'll share your comments with us and look for more episodes coming up.